Okay, so uh, I was uh, reading a comment uh, a little while ago, um, earlier today, and somebody asked me, um, basically I had talked about a different contradiction and, uh, or a supposed contradiction, and so then they sent me this link to this video um, and told me to go and give a rebuttal for every single supposed contradiction. And at first I said, no, I'm, I'm not doing that. Like, if, if, if you want to have a, have a conversation, I feel, still feel the exact same. If you want to have a conversation, absolutely, I, I'll totally engage. But if your point is just to make fun of my beliefs, like, there's no reason why we should even have the conversation because all it's going to consist is you already have, have your mind made up and you're just trying to be mean. And it's kind of a waste of time. But then the more I got to thinking about it, the more I thought, you know, it might be a good idea to address this. Um, so uh, here it goes. Uh, first off, before we, look at, before we look at anything, it's always easier to make fun of a book that you don't understand. And I think that that really does need to be said. Um, you know, I can read Shakespeare and not try to understand it, but instead try and make fun of it. Well, that's going to be easy to do if I don't understand Shakespeare. And in the same way, the person who made this video or persons um, really have no concept of the Bible itself. It's um, it's like they, they didn't really even look real, real deep at stuff, which surprises me because in the video's description, he goes to great lengths to show um, that he really did do his homework. So I'm, I'm a little bit confused. It's like he stopped when the answers became inconvenient or something. I don't know. Um, obviously, not all views that people hold are correct or equally valid. There is there is one right and there's one wrong. Um, coexisting, that's fine and everything, but that doesn't mean that truth becomes relative. There is either this is true or it is not true. Um, so that, that absolutely is true. However, bigotry is when you are intolerant to someone else's opinions, um, making fun of them, uh, being, um, what's it called? Um, uh, being, uh, were, you, were you talking down to them? I forget what the word is that I'm trying to think of. Anyway, so whether God exists or whether there is evidence for heaven, God, etc. is outside the scope of this rebuttal. In fact, most of the video seemed very unorganized, um, which... Once again, really wasn't that big of a point because it really doesn't make anything that he said not a relevant question. Um, but one thing that is important is that whenever you're trying to find the truth of something, never come to it with bias. When you're trying to answer a hard question, like big good questions like is evolution true, um, is the Bible uh, reliable, is it you know you, you don't want to just go into the thing looking at it with bias. You want to look at it with maybe it's true and maybe it's not true. Let's look and weigh the facts and then make an informed decision. Um, so I would highly encourage that because the guy who made this video, obviously um, this video that I'm that I'm re giving re a rebuttal to. And I'll try to remember to put the description down below. But evidently this guy um, did not come without bias because um, he very much so has his mind made up from the beginning. So the first contradiction is about God's anger. And he contrasts Micah 7.18 through Jeremiah 17.4. So once again, I don't really want to spend too much time on any of these single contradictions because he goes through over 20 contradictions in under 10 minutes, so I really don't want to spend too much time here. But given the context, forever in this context doesn't mean duration, but it means an ir that it will be irreversible and lasting. And you might say, well, that sounds a little bit stupid. Well, that's how they use the word. In ancient uh, writings, words don't have a one-for-one -one equivalent. Um, no culture does. No, no, ling no two languages are exactly the same. So there will be a slight... Um, problem there, but then especially in ancient in ancient languages, they kind of had, had a more basic uh, language structure. Um, and so they would have words that would have really broad meanings. And, and we still do that in, in modern days too. Maybe not to the same extent, but we definitely do. Uh, another example of this is Jude 7 where he's talking about Sodom and Gomorrah uh, burning with eternal you know, fire. Well, obviously they're not still burning, but you can the writers of the Bible talk about it as eternal in the sense of um, its lasting effect is is eternal. Everybody knows about Sodom and Gomorrah. Even people who don't read the Bible know about Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, so in the same in the same reason, there's no reason why we should assume that these are contradicting each other. Um, and Judah's punishment would come, and it would always be a warning uh, to those afterwards. It would always be something that they looked back on, and that's exactly what has happened. Um, when Israel came out of exile and, and went back into the Promised Land, um, it was always something that that was in their heads, you know, about their exile. And then even throughout Christian history too, it's it's been always been a real big turning point because 
it seemed like a contradiction in and of itself. You know, that here's God, um, Israel's God, and it's, he seemed to have turned his back on them. So this was kind of a, a big historical thing, and exactly like Jeremiah 17.4 says, it did have a lasting effect. The second supposed contradiction is, does God tempt people? Short answer is no. Genesis 22.1 doesn't say that God tempted Abraham. It says that he tested Abraham. In the same way, it could be said in Job that God tested Job. Um, once again, he, he allowed Satan to do his thing, but ultimately God was still in control, which means that God was the one who allowed it to happen. So it could be said that God tested Job. James 1.13 James 1 says that God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Um, and what it says there is that it says that it comes from us. In other words, God may allow us to be in a situation where, for instance, looking at pornography is wrong. God may allow us to be in a situation where we have the choice to either look at pornography or not to look at pornography. God is not tempting us. It's our own passions within us that are, that are causing us to go astray. And that's very obviously what it means. So God tested or tried Abraham. He didn't tempt him. He didn't say, hey, hey, buddy, you want to you wanna go do this? Yeah, buddy. He, he didn't do that. God doesn't tempt people, but he does give them opportunity to sin. Example, for instance, Adam and Eve in the garden, he gave them the opportunity to eat from the tree or not to eat from the tree. When he took Israel into Canaan, he gave them the opportunity to obey him or to follow the Canaanites. Um, I already said about the pornography thing. However, temptation doesn't come from God. Um, Satan might tempt us with something. Uh, we might tempt ourselves with something. But God never tempts someone, although he does test us. Because obviously, if we never have the choice to obey, we never really can obey. Um, obedience can't be made in a vacuum. There, there has to be a choice of whether to or not to. The third contradiction is salvation by works, and he gives all these different scriptures. Now, this one I actually do get the confusion on. Um, a lot of people have, have this confusion. So let me kind of break it down, and I'll say it in three different ways. First off, works and faith are inseparable. If you have faith, works will follow. That doesn't mean that your works will earn your faith or that your works will earn your salvation. Um, you cannot be saved by your works, but if you have faith, you will also have works. Another way of saying that, works are evidence of faith, and faith without works is dead. I mean, this is exactly what the Bible itself says. Um, so we were created for good works, but doing the good works is a sign of our faith, but at the same time, it doesn't save us. So another con another supposed contradiction that he brings up, can you see God? I already looked at this in another video, so I'm not really going to spend too much time here. But the short answer is that no one has seen God the Father, but the Son, who is fully God, has made him known. So it can be said that we have seen God and seen the Son, see what I mean, whereas we still haven't seen the Father. Um, even still, even if you don't like that answer, there's an even simpler answer when it, the Bible says uh, in this same area that he's talking about all these different things in Exodus, he says that he's going to send the angel of the Lord with them, and the angel of the Lord has God's name in him. He is a representative of God, and so to see the angel of the Lord was to see God. Now, once again, you might not say, well, that's how I would have worded it. Well, you aren't an ancient Israelite, and the Bible wasn't written now it was written, you know, 3,500 years ago. So it's kind of, kind of important to realize that culture has changed, and just because you wouldn't have said something that way doesn't mean that it, they shouldn't have said it then like that. Um, another fifth supposed contradiction: Does God delight in burnt offerings? Now this is something that I could really make a whole long thing. I'm actually even writing a book on the law, and I'll talk about sacrifices and different stuff like that, but. Obviously, I have to give a limited reply here. Jeremiah 7, 22, Exodus 20, 24, he kind of gives a couple different things. I don't really want to look too much at them. You can watch his video, and you can want, read the verses yourself. As they sought after God, he would bless them. However, a sacrifice for the sake of a sacrifice was pointless. It was the heart that mattered, and he showed us this before the law was ever even given in Genesis chapter 4, verse 3, and uh, again in verse 7, where Cain and Abel both offer a sacrifice, but Cain is rejected. And then God says this, if you do well, will you, won't you? you be accepted? Um, which is obviously a rhetorical question. Yes, you will be accepted. So the issue was the, was the heart. It's not the sacrifice itself that God delights in. It's, in, it's the obedience and it's the trust in God. Um, another little brief point here, the law was never meant to be a permanent thing. And that's a conversation for another day, though. 
Um, God did not come up with offerings people did. People were, were offering sacrifices long before the law was ever given. Long before the law was ever given. Um, he didn't give new meaning to them until they were at Sinai. And Sinai. Instead, the first thing he told them when he was leading them out, out of Egypt, he told them to obey. He didn't say anything about sacrifices. He didn't talk about sacrifices until after they had been freed from Egypt, had walked all the way to Sinai, and had been at Sinai. Then God told them about um, the sacrifices. So in that way, in Jeremiah 7.22, I think is the one that he quotes where it says, um, when I brought them out of Egypt, I didn't give them I didn't give them sacrifices. And that's absolutely true. He waited until they were at Sinai. And uh, that was only to establish uh, meaning for them, to, to take a system that they already used. Um, and this is something people really don't understand because they don't – people don't study the ancient Near East, but then they assume to know everything about the law, and they criticize the law even though they have no idea about the context that the law was given in. For instance, the tabernacle that, that the um, Jews built, there were other tabernacles that were very similar – at the exact same time. The only difference is that Israel's didn't have a idol inside. But once again, I'm getting off topic here. As a sixth supposed contradiction, is God the author of evil? And he says there and there, and I don't really know if his first John 4 8 um, reference was intentional because it talks about love. I'm, I'm not quite sure what his point was with that one. But the short answer is no. Um, God is the God brings disaster, not evil. Um, so okay. Um, so the idea here is that God brings punishment the same as he brings blessing. And the bigger – in context, the bigger idea here is that God is sovereign. See, um, there were all these other ideas with different gods about how some gods cause blessing and some, God, and some gods would cause, ble cause curses and some gods, gods would cause both. And then there were spirits. Um, and then that, So there were all kinds of different, different things there. But in contrast to all those beliefs, Isaiah 45, 7 clearly, clearly says, no – God is the same one who punishes you for your evil and who gives you blessing for your obedience. So once again, not a contradiction. You just have to see it in its context. And some might say at this point, well, the KJV says, let me just kind of end this whole thing. The majority of supposed Bible contradictions are brought up from the King James. And the reason why is because it's a dated translation. It's not very reliable. It doesn't use um, the oldest manuscripts. It's just not overall the best to judge what the Bible originally said from. So um, once again, this is something that's proven time and time again. The King James Version is just not very reliable. It hasn't aged well. Um, it should probably go ahead and be retired and replaced with newer translations or just go straight to the Greek. That would work better. Or the Hebrew if you're talking about the Old Testament. Um, so then the seventh um, supposed contradiction, were humans created before the animals? This is actually once again an issue with your translation, not an issue with what it actually says. Um, the passage in 125 clearly says that we were created afterwards. In 218, he says, now the animals that had been created were brought to Adam. See, God had created them previously, and he now at this point brought them to Adam. But once again, when someone is irrationally hateful, which is very obvious from, from the video that I'm, that I'm doing this review of, they usually become blinded, and this doesn't just become – obvious and, and, and religious issues, we're talking about all things. Um, you know, some people are real hateful t towards people who believe or just believe in evolution, believe or just believe in God, so on and so forth. And someone, when, when someone becomes that irrationally hateful, they usually become blinded and they just kind of stick with, you know, what they want to be true and, and they don't actually look um, very objectively. So why would the biblical authors honestly contradict themselves within the span of a few verses? Um, I think that if I was writing, because you know I have actually written books and and papers and all kinds of different stuff, why would I contradict myself right afterwards? And if I wanted to be taken seriously, why wouldn't I spell check this stupid thing and just say, hey, look, I just contradicted myself? So maybe we shouldn't hop to the immediate cop out of, hey, instead of learning anything or trying to learn anything or trying to understand. And you see the exact same thing happen a lot of times with Christians. Excuse me. They say something about the Quran, and then you say, "Oh, you've read the Quran," and they say, "Well, no, I haven't read the Quran." It's like, well, so how do you know if you haven't actually read it? See what I mean? Um, so well, once again, that's a little bit of a sidetrack, I guess. The eighth supposed contradiction: Did Paul's companions hear the voice? No, this actually has more to do with the word itself. In Greek, it's called phone. Um, its meaning is noise, voice, sound. Um, so it doesn't just mean voice; it also means sound and noise. With that being said, we can very obviously, once again, 
just assume here. They heard the sound, but it was unintelligible to them. To Paul, it was a voice, but to them, it was just a sound. Translating is not as easy as it sounds, and is sometimes trial and error. That is very true. There's been often times when we're just not quite sure how to translate something, and then archaeology or whatever, further research or whatever, will kind of enlighten how we should have translated it. And so instead, um, we'll go and we'll retranslate it. That's not because we're changing something. It's because we just weren't real sure of how to change it. And once again, this is a pr perfect example of that. So, you know, they did hear something. They just didn't hear the voice. They didn't hear um, what was being said. They just kind of heard a noise, um, which the ESV kind of resolves this. Read those passages in the ESV as compared to the KJV, and you'll kind of see um, how they worked at the uh, to sort it out. The ninth supposed contradiction with the last earth lasts forever. Now this is a little bit different. This has to do with genres. Okay. So basically Ecclesiastes is a wisdom book which isn't meant to be taken literally. And St. Peter is a letter given to churches which was very much so meant to be taken literally. And we see the exact same thing nowadays uh, if you compare Robert Frost's poetry to H.G. Wells' you know, science, science fiction. It, it's very obvious that they shouldn't be understood in the same way. And it's the exact same thing with the Bible. Ecclesiastes wasn't meant to be understood in the same way as St. Peter was. So uh, we have different types of literature, and they have to be understood differently. Um, the point of Ecclesiastes is he's contrasting the shortness of human life with the consistency of the earth. Not that the earth will last for forever. And once again, we see this exact same meaning in the, in the law, where it says that the law will go on for forever. Forever isn't always literal. It's more of ongoing. And that's what the note there says. It says, see also the practice. Hold on. Let me move this out of the way here. Boop. The practice of the law. Um, it said that the law was meant to be kept forever. It didn't actually mean forever. It's more of in perpetuity, ongoing. Um, obviously, the law itself testified to the day that the law would be obsolete. So to then assume that the law, which testified to its own inadequacy, was assuming that it would exist forever is just not based. The Once again, words kind in ancient cultures have different, a much broader meaning than we have ours. Is Jesus the only man to have ascended into heaven? This completely misses the point of this passage. Um, it's not saying that, that nobody has gone to heaven. People have gone to heaven, such as uh, Elijah. But Jesus alone had descended from heaven with heavenly knowledge, and he would then ascend again. Once again, if you read John 3.13, it's part of a, part of a, of a conversation between him and a Pharisee. So to just jerk one verse out of context and say, it's a contradiction, well, maybe you should read the rest of what's being said. Remember, you can get the Bible to confirm or deny many different things, from owning slaves to, I mean, everything. So if you don't look at the contradiction, I mean, so if you don't look at the context, you're not going to catch all these little nuances. Um, read the context of hard verses. If you read the previous two verses, 11 and 12, he very obviously gives us what he's talking about. Um, another way to look at this is no one has ascended into heaven for this knowledge. In other words, nobody has gone to heaven so as to bring the knowledge down, but Jesus has descended to give it. Once again, that's an issue of translation, which I really don't want to get into because that's a whole other conversation. Um, the eleventh supposed contradiction, are children punished for the sins of their fathers? No. And those are the verses. Um, if you notice at the end of, I think it's the... I think it's the 591. It says, of those who hate me. Basically, if you continue in the sins of your father, God will bring generational curses. Um, there's some people who don't believe in that translation. They say, they say, they say no, no, that's not how it should read. Um, I really think that it, that is how it should read. But once again, not everything that I say is necessarily true. It's just an option. You don't have to immediately hop to the option of it's not. It, it's a contradiction. I mean, there are other options besides it's a contradiction. Um so, but here's the bigger idea. Here's that consequences of actions affect children. For instance, who sinned in the Garden of Eden? Adam and Eve. Yet, who has to pick up the pieces? Us. And in a bigger context, Jesus had to pick up the pieces because in the same way that death came into the world through Adam, so through Jesus, um, we have new life. Um, however... Um, the main point here being that the, con the consequences of our actions affect children. We see the same thing when a children is raised in a, in a druggy household where the parents are doing drugs. Um, the parents are, are, are doing the sin. They're, they're the ones doing the drugs, and yet the kids are impacted by it. Children are not to be punished for what their parents did, though what we do affects others, including our children. This really doesn't cause – it's really not too hard of a passage to understand. 
And Ezekiel even clarifies this when he says, well, you can read Ezekiel for yourself. Uh, the twelfth supposed contradiction, does God get tired? Once again, this has to do with more of genres than anything. In um, 114 and 43, 24, God is obviously using dramatic ling language, more of uh, metaphorical or, or, you know, that kind of idea. Uh, dramatic language to emphasize how meaningless their sacrifices were and how stubborn Israel had been. However, 28, he's saying, literally, I, 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 don't, I don't get tired, um, which is obvious from the context. I mean, honestly, do you really think that that Isaiah or his scribe or later editors would all have said, yeah, you know what, there's this obvious contradiction here. Let's go ahead and leave that. I mean, seriously, if the Bible has lasted for thousands of years, I mean, honestly, maybe instead of immediately hopping to the conclusion of they're just – everyone who believed in it was, was just an idiot. Well, that's an idea, but don't you think that might be a little bit arrogant that you're the only person who has, who has seen the truth and that everybody else – I mean, come on. Come on. Um, so let's talk real briefly on bigotry here. Making fun of people, and he has these little clips twice in the video where he just um, – it's like a montage, I guess you could say, of people saying um, things about the Bible not being um, contradictory. And um, he doesn't actually judge or, or, or criti critique what they've said. He just simply throws it in to make fun of them. And so that brings up my point here. Making fun of people in out-of-context clips, it's both unhelpful and unprofessional. First off, it's unhelpful in that it doesn't actually do anything to – help us to to discover whether the truth is contradict the bible is contradictory or not and then the second thing is it's unprofessional in that professional people don't waste their time making fun of people that's something that richard dawkins do real scientists real philosophers real people like that they, they don't they don't waste their time attacking people they attack ideas big difference um they didn't get to defend themselves he just quoted them out of context purposefully obscuring the truth or, or further study for the sake of his own ego. I mean, that's not that's not professional. Um, obviously, it uh, doesn't validate your point. Whenever you do that, that kind of stuff, it doesn't validate the point that you're trying to make. Um, so just to recap everything, so far at the, what is it, like three or four minute mark of the video, there has been so far no con contradiction, no attempt at explanation, just vague references. See, he, he doesn't actually say why the things are contradictions he just throws out bible bible references and you know real vague references and says it's a contradiction but we have yet to find any 13th contradiction how many from saint samuel versus first chronicles the chronicles includes more precise numbers than those excluded by joab whereas 20 in the saint samuel passage it doesn't have a precise number and it even says this in Second Samuel, it says these are the numbers that Joab reported to David. Whereas in First Chronicles, it says these are the actual, these are the numbers, and it says, but Joab didn't include the people from the from this group and this group. In other words, Job lied. The number in Second Samuel was Job's report, which was a lie. First Chronicles has the actual report, um, which once again, if you just read what the read what it says itself, I mean, there's really not that difficult to resolve this. Um, here's another one of his counting. Um, here's the problem with this one is we have no way of knowing for sure. It says um, the 20,000 foot soldiers, okay, all right, which may be, uh, may be symbolic, may be literal. I'm going to leave that up to you. Um, but then it says, you know, 1,000 of the chariots, 1,700 of the horsemen, and then in the other one it says 7,000 horsemen. Um, here's the problem is we're not quite sure of how it should read. So it might be a problem with the manuscripts that we have because we don't have any of the originals. All that we have are copies, so it is possible that it, this was a corruption. That is fully pos possible. However, we also have another problem. See, Saint Samuel was written earlier in Israelite history, and First Chronicles was written later, and so the same word m meant things differently at different times. Just like nowadays, um, even a hundred, few hundred years earlier, you have a big difference. So we're unsure of the translation in, in Saint Samuel, whether it's thousands or um, or companies. Chronicles could be precise, while Samuel is talking about companies. For instance, 1,700 companies of uh, in Saint Samuel, which translated to 7,000 in total horsemen from First Chronicles. So once again, we're not quite sure of the translation of this one, but we shouldn't necessarily instantly hop to it's a contradiction when there are other perfectly reasonable um, solutions. But the problem is we don't have enough data to know for sure. The 15th supposed contradiction. 
uh, First Chronicles 21 verse uh, Saint Samuel 24 24 how much did uh, did David buy the place for well actually if you just read the account it, it tells itself and saying it Samuel it gives the gives the price as 50 shekels for the one small spot and the sacrifice in First Chronicles it includes the whole part because David bought a much bigger section for the temple to be built on by his son Solomon but he didn't he evidently didn't buy it at this at this time um, he only bought the 50 shekels at that time but then evidently at some later time which first chronicles details he spent 600 shekels for the whole area so that Solomon could build the temple once again this isn't something that I'm bending scripture this is something that is obvious from what the bible itself says the 16th supposed contradiction second samuel versus first chronicles okay i don't know why i did that um this one is a little bit difficult, and I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure on this one, and this really is, I, I believe, the only one that I was a little bit not sure about. Um, let me go to it. In First Chronicles 11:11, 11, 11, it says this. This is an account of David's mighty man, Joshua Beam, a Hecamanite, was chief of the three. Now, it goes on and it says that he killed 800. Now, see, it, it might be a bigger problem because the two different accounts have a slightly different name, which could be the same name, just different forms of it. So there is that. So it could be different people or not. It could be two different events. Maybe at one time he slew the 300, at one time he slew the 800. It really isn't overly clear. Um, and it doesn't say that he slew 300 and never slew anymore, and it also never says that he slew 800 and never did he slew, slew, slew anymore. It could also be an error, obviously. Um, there's always that option when you're dealing with ancient literature. Sometimes, you know, for instance, look at Egyptian, you know, manuscripts. You'll, somebody will come by and say, that, hey, this is this translation of these hieroglyphs. Some, some later person will come by and say, well, no, this looks like it might be more of this. And there'll be this debate that follows. Um, where people just aren't sure. So it could definitely be an error, or it could be an unforeseen solution that me nor the author nor this other person who did this video can see right now. So a side note, a contradiction is not the same as a scribal error. See, we believe that the Bible is inerrant um, as it applied to the originals, not to the copies. Well, since we don't have any of the copies, I mean, sorry. We, since we don't have any of the originals, we have to kind of guess sometimes with the with the um, copies. Now we we're, there's a 97 to 99 percent um, sure surety. Uh, we're 97 to 99 percent sure that what we have is exactly what was written. However, there is obviously room for error. For instance, was John 8 there originally or not? Um, However, and Aaron doesn't, okay, I already said that. Many of these have no bearing on the message, and this just kind of, I know it's, well, if it's a contradiction, well, yeah, and I get that. And once again, I am answering these contradictions, but just remember that it's not, it doesn't necessarily invalidate the claim. For instance, there are many times when an Egyptian pharaoh will, will make a claim that's not really supported by any facts. And that doesn't mean that he didn't necessarily go and fight that war. It just he might have stretched some of the facts. That doesn't mean that once again that it's not it's not reliable. It just may be not overly literal. So once again, if we can give such grace to Egyptian pharaohs, I'm sure we can give grace on the case of something that we just don't understand. There are also apparent problems with the king's lists, um, which many people have said. For more on that, you can see Thiel. Um, he wrote a he wrote a fantastic book which I highly recommend. Seventeenth contradiction, supposed contradiction. Uh, who mocked Jesus? Well, evidently he had a change of heart in the face of the the the, the, the he was hung or crucified with two um, two uh, robbers or thieves or whatever. Um, which interesting, it might have been um, Barabbas's two of Barabbas's men and the stuff was already in place to hang all three of them, and then when they switched out Barabbas for Jesus. But that's for another conversation. Anyways, um, um, evidently, you know, they were both making fun of him. Somewhere along here, the, one of the guys had a change of heart, possibly because they were about to die, um, or the author simply ignored the repentant one because he was trying to emphasize the humiliation of Jesus. That's fully possible, that one of, the, one of them just simply um, grouped them all together. Um, that's possible, obviously. Um, so is it a contradiction? Well, I, that kind of sounds like a contradiction, which is why I kind of lean toward, towards the whole thing about um, the guy had a change of heart, which is fully possible. 
Um, you know, and, and we see that same thing happen when you contrast the books of Kings with the books of Chronicles. Sometimes Kings will say about these wicked people, and Chronicles will say about how they were how they repented, when Kings never says that they repented. It just it, uh, ignores things to prove its main point, which, once again, the Bible is not meant to be a, a complete historical account of everything. It, it obviously was written for a purpose. Um, 18th contradiction, how many were healed? Well, it never says that there was one and only one, so there is that. Uh, it's very common to refer to people collectively as he, if he was the prom predominant one speaking. Um, for instance, it'll say, you know, he and his whole household or whatever, you know, and so it's possible well, there's many different possibility, possibilities, but remember that this, it also doesn't mean that there were just two. There could have been five or eight. It doesn't say specifically how many people there were. Um, it just says that for sure one of who they were, and um, it mentions two people at another time. I mean in another gospel. Ancient cu cultures are not modern cultures. They didn't write in the, in the see right now. we People want things to be written nowadays in a very precise manner. Well, when you say there was one, so there was no one else there? Well, no, they didn't say that. In, in, in ancient cultures, they didn't write in the same way. They didn't think in the same way that we think now. Um, Greek, for instance, was a very oral culture. Um, and we're not a very oral culture. Um, so there's just there's just a big bunch of differences there. The 19th supposed contradiction there. Um, we can piece together from the accounts once again. Um, none of them have a complete record, so we can piece them together from marrying them together. Where once again, none of these are mutually exclusive. None of these say this happened and the other thing didn't happen. So some women were going to the tomb. How many? We don't know. One of them got there slightly before the others. Doesn't doesn't have to say how many women there were, were there, as it never does in any of the accounts. So to expect that one account will be different than all the other accounts just doesn't really make much sense. They saw two angels. One was outside and one was inside, or one had previously been outside and then went inside. Um, it allows for either translation or either idea there. Um, that's not an issue of translation. That's an issue of understanding. Um, but if you notice this guy's video around this point, he starts going into rapid fire attack to try and prove his point. But he should have tried harder to validate any one single point because he failed to understand ancient writing style. He failed to understand ancient culture. He failed to understand the context of the passages. He just tried to go rapid fire. Now, when you're watching a video and somebody's going rapid fire and they don't actually stop to explain their views, don't get caught up in it. Stop and analyze what they're saying because people, politicians do this too. They'll try and just da -da 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 -da, where, where it floods you. If you've ever had um, a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon come to your door, they do the exact same thing. They try to do a rapid fire to where you can't quite process it fast enough. Oh, hold on, what? And so you just kind of accept it because, wow, that sounds pretty damning. Um, so the uh, 20th supposed contradiction. Well, before I go to that, if, if I were to ask you who made Star Wars, you'd say George Lucas. But the truth is that a lot of people made Star Wars. Um, and now Disney owns it, so in a way, Walt Disney um, made Star Wars. You see what I mean? Like it, it, It's not really a thing of precision here. Um, and then he brought up the thing about uh, God's character, which is very irrelevant to the conversation. We're trying to say whether the Bible is a con it contradicts itself or not. So if God is loving and just and has to be judged... Otherwise, there is no standard, and he really isn't all that good. See, if God says that he hates evil, but then he doesn't do anything about evil, how exactly does that make him a just judge? But, however, he is patient, but he does hate evil. See what I mean? And, and there will be punishment for sin. That's just a fact. You don't have to like that. That's just the truth of who God is. So he goes on this great thing, contradicting, uh, try, contradicting wrong, wrong word. We're talking about contradictions. He goes on this lengthy thing trying to um, invalidate God by simply saying that he doesn't agree with God's standard. Well, big surprise there. The Bible itself tells us that people aren't going to agree with God's standard. We like to assume that we are the final solution. You know, slavery is wrong because we believe that it's wrong. Well, okay. Homosexuality is okay because we say that homosexuality is okay. Well, okay. Child molestation is wrong because we we say that. See what I mean? Now, I'm, I'm not validating or invalidating any of those things. I'm not commenting on them. I'm just simply saying we like to believe that we are the final authority. But the truth is if morality means anything, then it has to be a standard of some kind. So that's a conversation for another time again. 
But long story short here, when he goes off into this thing criticizing God for demanding the death sentence and different stuff like that, that's not a contradiction. That's – he has a problem with God's character. He doesn't like who God says he is. So he fails to understand the laws in contrast to other ancient Near Eastern laws. I mean that's just true. Many of those things that he said about the, how the law demanded um, that they be killed is something that ancient Near Eastern laws also demanded. It, wa it wasn't something that was new. So once again, maybe read some books on the ancient Near East before you start criticizing too much of the law. Because the law is a very complex um, complex thing. And uh, if you don't understand it, you're just going to sound like an idiot. And for his critique of the law, you really did sound like an idiot because he really didn't understand the law itself or the context that the law was given. So God has a standard of right and wrong. Failure to understand the laws and not agreeing with the laws do not make them contradictions. Which, once again, this is completely irrelevant to, this discuss irrelevant to the discussion as whether or not the Bible is contradicting itself. Um, and once again, Israel was held to the same standard as Canaan was. Although God was patient with Israel, eventually they were punished. 21st, supposed contradiction. Um, really wasn't a contradiction. It was just a sweeping statement. Assuming that, that belief in God is illogical or that someone cannot believe in God and be reasonable is a baseless claim. He hasn't proven that at all. He just randomly assumed that. Well, so then you have to say, okay, has there ever been a Christian who was reasonable? Has there ever been a, a, a Christian who believed in evolution or science or anything like that? See what I mean? You can't just make a, a sweeping claim that to believe in God is illogical unless you prove the claim. Um, also, once again, you have to prove the claim that believing in God makes someone unreasonable. Um, he has a bunch of straw man fallacies, doesn't really have anything that has to do with the, whether the Bible contradicts itself. Once again, don't get caught up in somebody's really nice speech. Oh, it sounds really good, and it kind of confirms what I already believe. So rather than actually thinking about this, I'm just going to, hey, I believe it. See what I mean? Uh, implying that the Bible says something, it doesn't say he does it over and over again. So this really isn't a contradiction. So let's go on a little bit more. Um, Matthew 7, 24. I don't even know what his point was there. Um, but it's not a promise. It's a parable. The man who does this is like that. Luke 6, 6, 24, given the context, Jesus is not talking about wealth or the rich generally, but people who live for their wealth and don't help others. See verses 20 through 23. Also, another thing worth mentioning is that in ancient culture, you weren't prized for being able to directly quote somebody, but rather to clarify what they said. In other words, the Gospels don't have to uh, quote Jesus verbatim in order to be accurate for their time. The accuracy was based off of did you keep the spirit of what was said, and did you um, did you expound on what Jesus said? So once again, the Gospels themselves can have minor variations in how things are worded and not be wrong. Um, for instance, compare the Gospel of John and how Jesus talks there to the rest of the three Gospels and how he talks there, and you can see that obviously these are this is not exactly how he talked. So Psalm 112 through 1, and 1 through 2, riches can be a blessing. Once again, this is not a promise. It's a song. The Psalms are songs. So this is kind of a relevant point there. Um, however, once again, the rest of the Bible shows, for instance, in the book of Job, that that's not always how things work. Sometimes righteous people suffer. Sometimes wicked people prosper. Um, however, the point of Psalm 112, 1 through 2 can, it is still true. Riches can be a blessing. Luke 18, 22, once again, not a command for everyone. Um, 1233, once again, talking about not living for temporary gain, but for God's glory. And 1433 is not simply limited to just wealth. His point is more sweeping than that. God has to come first before anything. So, once again, going, going rapidly through them without really expounding on them is kind of shooting yourself in the foot. This account here where it says that the that the early disciples were sharing, it's not it's not instructional, it's descriptive, this is what they were doing. However, it its point is that you know money wasn't owning them. In fact, right in there it says uh, the account of Ananias and Sapphira where they tried to get the same prestige from doing it without actually doing it. Um, and once again, this has nothing to do with socialism or communism. This is what they did among the body. The believers did it to one another, not to the people in the community. So Keep that in mind. The Bible never condemns or condones communism or socialism, nor does it contradict itself on that. That is nothing more than a red herring. Basically, he spends his time trying to stir up sometimes um, a bias that some people have 
trying to make that reflect poorly on the Bible, but those two things are not um, not mutually exclusive. They are separate from each other. Some people who believe in the Bible do not believe in communism. Some people who do who do not believe in the Bible do believe in communism. See what I mean? Like you you can't group them all together. So that conversation is a complete red herring. It has nothing to do with the contradiction at all. The final contradictions I'm not even going to give scripture references for because you can just go on to his video to get the scripture references. Did the curtain rip before or after Jesus died? It never says in any of the accounts. It just mentions that it did. It never says, hey, this happened after this. It never says that. All of them mention that it did happen. None of them mention when it happened. Um, who put the robe on Jesus? Once again, evidently they both did. Was it... Pilate's uh, soldiers or was it Herod's soldiers? Both of them. They both did. Um, it doesn't say that Pilate's soldiers put it on, put a robe on him and only they put a robe on him. Nor does it say that Herod's soldiers put a robe on him and only they put it on him. See, once again, you're making a contradiction where one doesn't exist. Did Jesus curse the fig tree before or after? Gospels are not arranged chronologically. That's just a fact. For instance, the Gospel of Matthew, it's a well-known fact that the thing is not arranged chronologically. Every, nobody's going to deny that. Mark, for instance, separates the event and its conclusion into a two-day event. Matthew does not. He doesn't really care. He's arranging it more topically. So the, the tree began to die at once the day before. It didn't finish till the following day. That's absolutely true. Um, it may have taken them a day to see the results, but the tree definitely had um, begun withering um, at once. And with that being said, once again, Matthew is not saying chronologically. He's just he he doesn't he just puts it all lumps it all together to more of prove a point than anything. Um, the final uh, some um, some more things uh, should homosexuals be killed or exiled? It never once says to exile homosexuals. It says that a king. Um, got rid of the male cult prostitutes. Now, once again, if you know anything about the ancient Near East, they had cult prostitutes. Basically, uh, they, these aren't regular prostitutes. They would work with the cult, like, for instance, the cult of Baal or the cult of a Ashtoreth, and you would have sex, sexual relations with them, and that would have something to do with fertility, um, with your crops for the next year, or so on and so forth. So once again, cult prostitutes are not the same as homosexuals. homosexuals. Now, with that being said, sin is worthy of death. Anybody who sin, any sin equally, any every sin equally separates us from God, but not all sins are equal. Um, so the law, yes, did give the, the death penalty for homosexuality. However, we are no longer under the law, whereas homosexuality is still a sin, just the same as child molestation is a sin. Just the same as, which by the way, child molestation is never once mentioned in the law, but we still know that it's a sin. That's a whole other conversation for another time, but just remember that. Um, um, however, we are no longer under the sin. Homosexual, homosexuality is still a sin, but we don't have to kill them because we are not Israel and we are not under the law. Um, within Israel, an Israel was an Israelite was not allowed to be homosexual because it goes homosexuality goes against God's standard, the same as adultery does, the same as having multiple wives does, um, which once again is a, a conversation for another day. Um, was Jesus born during the reign of Herod or, or Crinus? This has to do more with, or more with translation, but I'll get to that in just a second. Um, first off, we don't know exactly when Herod died, but probably 4 BC. That probably, not definitely, but probably. So there's that. You know, you can't take a probably and make it as absolute fact. Next off, there we have found proof that there are many Cranius's. So it's possible that there was a Crinius that was alive in Syria before the Crinius that we know of. We don't have complete and complete facts about the ancient world, and oftentimes we will never find proof. It will just be something that that's that's kind of um, it's off topic. So I'm trying to decide how long to go in it. But basically, the idea is this: with archaeology, we only know a little bit about a few things, and to then make say for certain just because we haven't found proof of something goes completely against the spirit of archaeology. I mean, we just don't know enough to make such steadfast claims. But however, it, 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 and the issue with translation I was saying, it should read something like this. The previous registration before Crinius was governor. Um, once again, um, that translation, we translated it one way because there were, there were two different possibilities, or at least two, I should say. And we didn't know which, but now that we know more historically what happened, we can know how to translate that word that was 
translated the first um, registration or census or whatever. Um, but once again, he quotes Wikipedia as a source. I mean, and he says about how he, you know, researched these things. Well, okay, let me just pause you right there. Wikipedia is not a valid source for anything to prove or disprove the Bible. I mean, really. The, my rebuttals come from directly from the Greek not, Greek text, which, yes, I do have a knowledge of the Greek text, and I can do these translations myself. So there's that. Um I didn't reply. I didn't go to Wikipedia for any of my sources. I went to actual scholars and actual um, articles, to actual books, and did the research myself. So let's just kind of back up there. Um, also, I just want to take a brief brief mention. Um, there's a there was a website called Got Questions that answers very very basic um, very basic Bible questions, and then also answers in Genesis, which is another one that answers questions. And so you can look at both of those. Um, was the tomb open or closed? Matthew never says that they saw the angel open the tomb, and neither does Luke say that they didn't see the angel open it. So it doesn't really say whether it was open or closed, just that the angel opened it. Um, how did Judas die? Well, we have two accounts. One says he hanged himself, one says he burst open, so we can piece them together and say he hanged himself. And then he fell from the tree after he had after he had died, and he was apparently bloated, and when he, when he, hit, when he hit the ground, he ripped open. I mean, that's... Totally reasonable. Is God the author of confusion? No. Can we view ancient writings the same as modern writings? No. So, with that being said, the val validity of a belief system has nothing to do with whether the Bible contradicts itself or not. So his whole long spiel at the end has literally nothing to do with his main points. However, it is worth noting that every, almost every single one of his biblical references was referenced wrong. First off, you put the lower number to the higher number, 4, 9, then 25, 4. Okay. Books in order, they appear in the Bible unless for a specific reason. For instance, you would mention Genesis before Exodus, um, Exodus before Leviticus, so on and so forth. The only reason for doing that is if you wanted to add extra emphasis to the one over the other. Um, there are two official biblical title abbreviations. He didn't follow either. Maybe stay more consistent with, with that. And I know this is nitpicking, but it is actually kind of an important point. Because if this was a paper that was submitted for a Bible class, they would have docked them points for this. This is actually kind of an important point. If I was reading a book that was published and it didn't have the correct citations, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't take the guy very, really really seriously. It just kind of hurts your... your, um, your what's it called? Um, when people can believe you. Um, credibility. Which, once again, I followed his, his system. I didn't correct. I, I corrected spelling errors and that kind of stuff, but I didn't fix it. I tried to stay pretty pretty same to how he had it. Um, when you're mentioning verses of the same chap chapter, you separate them by comma, 2, 3, comma, 6. When it's a new chapter, it's separated by semicolon, 2, 3, 4, 16. And it's when, different, and it, when it's different books, it's separated by comma. So a good example of this would be Deuteronomy 4, 9, comma, Joshua 1, 8, comma, 11, semicolon, 12, 3. See, did you see, did you see the difference there? That is how you correctly do it. So if you're going to make um, videos that, that, that um, bring out all these supposed contradictions, please do try to ha record your citations, or is it just your own research, in which case, you know, have that. Um, and then anything that you, that you do, list it correctly. Um, even if you're just quoting something, make sure that, that you quote it correctly. Um, I used a lot of the Expositor's Bible Commentary. I used, um, oh boy, the, I could go on and make lists and lists about all the, all the sources that I used. If you're curious about anything specific, just ask. Um, um, these answers may not all be correct. I, I, I might be wrong on a few things, but my main point is there are options other than instantly assuming that the biblical writers were just incoherent babblers. You mean to tell me that you you honestly believe that someone would say something and then instantly contradict themselves, and you don't think that maybe they knew what they were saying? I mean, let's let's just really take this a little bit one step at a time here. Um, so, anyways, I hope that that kind of brought some clarity. Um, I'm not trying to be hateful to the guy. I, I, I really I'm not, and I hope that didn't come off like that. I'm also not trying to be arrogant. Um, the real genius of all this stuff is that, that we really remember to stop and listen to other people and have actual conversations about stuff and um, you know that there be um, that there be a dialogue that goes on and we be open to the idea that we might be wrong. Uh, for instance, with evolution, um, I haven't really made up my mind whether I believe in evolution or not because there's a lot of blind spots with 
every evolution evolutionistic theory, but there's also a lot of blind spots with other theories, so or non-evolutionary theories. So it's kind of one of those things that I'm open to being proven wrong. And I think that we would do well to remember that. First off, if I don't agree with you, that doesn't mean that I hate you. Second off, not all views are, are correct. Third off, just because an answer doesn't isn't as obvious as it could be doesn't mean that it is your supposed solution is the only solution. So just remember these things, and uh, yeah.